Uh, good morning, church, and good morning to those of you who are watching us online this morning. It's a joy to have you with us as well. Uh, we're going to open our Bibles together to Matthew chapter 6. We've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount, and we've been focusing on kingdom habits. And over the last several weeks, we've really slowed down to look at the kingdom habit of prayer and, and how Christians should be identified as people of prayer. So as we turn our attention to the text this morning, we're going to look at the entirety of the, ser- the, the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer, the model prayer. But we're really going to focus our attention on verse 13. So if you have your Bibles open there, read along with me. The Word of God says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And Father, again, we do say amen. And Lord, we ask that you give us a spirit of wisdom and understanding to look to this familiar passage. That we would walk away from this place, changed by the power of your spirit. For the glory of your name, the name of Jesus our Savior, we pray. Amen. If you were to open up a browser tab and click on Amazon.com, you don't have to do this right now, but if you were to do this and you started typing in the word Christian self, it would automatically fill in help for women. I've done this multiple times for multiple computers, and this is the same thing. But if you just kind of go past that and you click Christian self-help books, you will find a queried search result list with more than 40,000 titles. Some of which are, don't quit in the dip. Stay focused on God's promises for you. Deliver me from negative self-talk, a guide to speaking faith-filled words. You be you. Why satisfaction and success are closer than you think. And honestly, I have no idea why this next book showed up in the list, but it did, so I figured I better share it with you. Elementary Algebra. For those of you who have ever wondered, how will I ever use algebra? What will it do for me? It is defined, apparently by Amazon, as a Christian self-help book. Moving on, living beyond your feelings, controlling emotions so they don't control you, and then The way of prosperity, God's provision for every area of your life. And in hearing these titles, I I think that we hear a lot of sermon titles from what we would expect or what we want or perhaps even what some people desire out of church. This morning as we look to the text and we look to this petition and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil... We recognize this truth. Christian, you need the power of God more than you need self-help. You need the power of God at work in your life, moving in and through you, a a filling of the Spirit fresh as we surrender to Him to guide you in your life much more than you need anything that's dwelled down deep inside of you that you can somehow unlock through the right words or the right phrase or the right reading of Scripture. We mentioned last week that prayer orients you to God as sustainer. And that's so very true. We're dependent upon Him for all we have. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who we have, uh, as we forgive our debtors. But Here we see not only the orientation of God as sustainer, but in this prayer, if we're praying this model prayer, we see that prayer orients you to God as your safeguard. Prayer orients you to God as your safeguard. Now consider that phrase again. Lead us not into temptation. There could be an understanding of this where people would say, 
Pastor, do you, do you really believe that God is the one leading people into temptation? Do you think God is the author of temptation or the author of evil? Is, is that what this prayer is teaching us? Is that the theological concept that we should be drawing out of here? And, and I, I think if you're looking at it this way, we're probably missing what Jesus is intending to say. Jesus, as he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying, let this cup pass from me, he looks to his disciples who had fallen asleep on more than one occasion, and he rebukes them by saying, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. This is a prayer of confession, not only forgive us our debts, but a prayer of confession, Lord, we need your strengthening in our lives strengthen us. The heart of the petition is not that God is the author of temptation, for James 1.13 says, no one when tempted should say, God is tempting me, nor is the heart of this prayer that we would escape somehow all temptation. Because even as we read in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan. I think the heart of, of this prayer is that we recognize, yes, temptations do refine our faith, but the heart of this petition is that God would not allow us to succumb to temptation or that he would not abandon us in the moment of temptation. Lord, lead us not into temptation to a point where we're abandoned or where we're succumbing to it. And in all of that, we're recognizing that God is our safeguard. John MacArthur once said, if you're a true Christian, I believe in my heart that you're just as concerned about your future sins being avoided as your past ones being forgiven. I mean, it's a glorious thing to come to faith in Christ and say, my sins are forgiven. My slate has been wiped clean. I am a child of God standing right before him. But a true Christian is not only concerned that his past sins are forgiven, but that he's not leading or walking into further sin in his or her life. Indeed, the holiness of God should stir in you a genuine fear of sin. It should be evidenced in your life that you don't want to rush into sin. There should be a holy fear of sin in your own life. And friends, we live in a culture that, that that's really counterculture. I mean, even the title of the book, You Be You, Why Does Satisfaction and Success Aren't As Far As You Think? You, you be you. you. You do what you want. I mean, you're probably not really going to hurt anybody. You just do what you want. Do your heart's desire. But th this prayer is born out of a heart that truly has a fear of walking into sin, of doing something that would provoke the wrath of, of a holy God. I am a complete idiot. Just the gospel mantra, I'm a complete idiot, but my future is incredibly bright and anyone can get on this. I'm a complete idiot. I realize that at any moment I can make a mess of my life. I, I can lose it with my wife, with my kids. I can become stressed and worry, and I can deal with it in inappropriate ways. I can make a mess of my life like that. And I don't really need you looking over my shoulder telling me how much of a mess I've made of my life. I get it. I own it. I know. I understand. But this prayer takes that reality very seriously. If we understand and know in our hearts that we can be led away from God just like that, then this prayer says, Lord, don't leave me there. Don't abandon me there. Don't allow me to succumb to this kind of pressure. It takes very seriously Jesus' words that he had mentioned just before in Matthew chapter 5. Remember when he's talking about lust? 
He says, if you looked at a woman with lustful intent, I tell you, you've already committed adultery. And then he goes on to say, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. We're not literally maiming ourselves, but if we take seriously these words, we say, I don't want to live in such a way that brings reproach to a holy God who saved me and claimed me in his own. I want to walk in holiness. I desire to live for him. But as I said last week, one of the biggest barriers to prayer is self-sufficiency. And you and I, we pick up the self-help books, we hear the positive sermon, and we just want to hear that good message so that somehow I can get my act together and I can do this and I can show God that I am worthy of his love and I can show the world that anybody can overcome. Self-sufficiency. I think one of the biggest lies of Satan that's been perpetuated by well-intentioned Christians, I, I don't think that there's a... And by the way, that's what Satan does, isn't it? He, he's the father of lies. He whispers lies. From the very beginning, he looked at Eve and he said, did God really say you will surely die? And then just begins to lie. Oh, he doesn't want you to do this because he doesn't want you to become like him. And so there's this lie, I believe, that is being perpetuated by well-intentioned Christians, and it sounds, it has a ring of truth to it. It's this, God will never give you more than you can handle. Uh, it sounds like a, a great promise. It sounds like something I can anchor myself to. God will never give you more than you can handle. And perhaps you've said this yourself. Maybe you've received that advice, and maybe you've hung on to that and cling to it at some time, but... Unfortunately, this truth, which isn't really a truth, but this position that you anchor yourself on, it, it feeds the self-sufficiency mindset. And it's consumed in the fiery furnace of our own pride, and we like the sound of this. I may have trouble. I may have temptations. But God knows I got this. He sure does have a lot of faith in me. Aren't I great? I can do this. He'll never give me more than I can handle. And some people walk around all built up and prideful and they've got this and I've got and God is on my side. And who can be against me? And then other people hear this phrase, God will never give you more than you can handle. And instead of building it up, it absolutely tears them down. It paralyzes the one who understands the weight of sin and the trouble that this life is crushing. And, and if that is true, God would never give me more than I can have. If that's true, then I don't have enough faith. I don't really belong to God because I've blown it too many times. I just give up. In Psalm 73 the psalmist there said that he considered the way of the wicked and how they prospered. And he said to himself, why am I trying so hard to live a godly life? It's just not worth it. They're succeeding, I'm failing. And this mindset, while empowering to some, is paralyzing to others. But the truth is, God regularly gives you more than you can handle to remind you that his strength is perfect in your weakness. That's where truth lies. That the circumstances of this life, the temptations that we face, the trials that we walk through are often more than we could ever bear or deal with on our own. And it's just a reminder to turn to the Lord who is perfect and whose strength is perfected in our own weaknesses. It should be just a regular habit of reminder in your life that 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is true. And maybe you don't have that memorized. Maybe it's not set in the anchor of your mind, but maybe this morning you'd say, this is something that needs to be bedrock foundational, anchored in my mind. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful 
with the temptation, he will provide a way of, of escape that you may bear up under it. It may be more than you can handle, but if you look to the Lord, if you begin to take this to him in prayer, you find the way of escape that you can bear up under that weight through his provision. Now, this is all the prayer. This is all the petition. Lead us not into temptation. And it parallels, but deliver us from evil. This is such good news. Jesus says to his disciples in Luke, when they say, teach us how to pray, he gives this model prayer. And here he's saying, pray like this. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Here's the great news. God is able to deliver you. God is able to deliver you. And, and you may think, there's no way God could reach to me. I'm so far from him. I'm so far removed from him that there's no hope for me. There is hope for you. God is able to deliver you. There's not one person who's walking on the face of this earth, who's alive today, who is so far from God that his grace is not deep enough to reach down and redeem and save each and every single one of them. The promise of Scripture and the promise of the Word is true. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I may be a complete idiot, but my future is incredibly bright. Because the death that I deserve, Christ died for me. And the life that I could never live, Christ lived for me. And he exchanged his perfect life for my sinful life. And now my future is in Christ. I get the future Christ deserves, not the future I deserve in my own sin. And in this moment, maybe you need to hear these words. And deliver us from evil. It may be addiction, it may be disease, it may be relationships, it may be a sinful heart that just seems to be in rebellion to God. God is able to deliver you. There is hope for this day. And by the way, if the worst thing that could happen to you as a child of God is that calamity would overtake you and death would remove you from this place, God is able to deliver you because death has been defeated. And that is no mere just saying there is victory even if life were taken from you. This truth reminds us what the enemy would have us doubt. That 1013 moment that you should have, maybe just set an alarm for 1013 and, and go read 1 Corinthians 1013. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. Because one of the other lies that Satan would have you believe in the moment of sin, in the moment of temptation, in the moment of calamity, in the moment of despair, there is no one who understands what you're going through. And you better not tell anyone what you're struggling with because if you do, they're going to laugh at you. They're, gonna not, I'm gonna, they're not going to understand. They won't understand a thing what you're thinking or what you're going through. You are alone in this. But the truth scripture says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And you are not alone or abandoned in your struggle. God is present. God is with you. Deliver us from evil.
It's a heart that longs to walk in the holiness of God, that prays these prayers. It's a heart that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, has been changed and transformed by his power that cries out, Lord, I, I don't want to live a life of sin. I don't want to live a life succumbing to temptation. Lord, I trust that you're with me and that you can deliver me. And then we come to the end of this prayer. And, and some of you were probably wondering, would we get to the end of this prayer? We just kind of kind of end with deliver us from evil. Because if you have uh, a translation other than the King James Version, that's probably footnoted somewhere in your scripture. Or, or, or maybe it's just kind of in the column margin. You don't see the words printed or maybe it's bracketed off for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And some of you wonder sometimes, and I've seen uh, Facebook people sharing like, well, this Bible isn't real because it doesn't have these verses. So just a quick moment of explanation and then we'll get to for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So the King James Bible was written nearly for, well, in 1611, 1609. The existent copies of Scripture were much older than what's been discovered to these days. So as Scripture is being read and being written and being understood, translated, we find that the majority of the oldest texts don't have that phrase, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, did Jesus not say those words? Is, is, is that not biblical? Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to the Old Testament for just a moment. The Old Testament book of 1 Chronicles, at verse chapter 29. It's not going to be on your screen, but I promise it's in your Bible. It's in the Pew Bible in front of you. 1 Chronicles 29, 11. David is praying a prayer and his doxology, the ending of his prayer is this. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens. And the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head above all. So is that phrase, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, is that a conveyance of inspired biblical truth? Absolutely. It's a prayer that David was inspired to pray at the very, in the Old Testament. We find it right there recorded in 1 Chronicles 29, 11. And as people begin to pray this model prayer, there, there was just this, this want to add a doxology to it, to add praise to it, to just kind of round out the praise with amen. And so this doxology was added to a, at a later date. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I still think it's very fitting to end the model prayer, the Lord's prayer, with those words. And those words are truth. Those words anchor us for understanding reality. And truth is the only trustworthy anchor for understanding reality. So when we're praying, we're fixing our eyes upon the Lord who is high and exalted in heaven, our Father whose name is hallowed and whose kingdom will come and his will will be done, who's able to sustain us and safeguard us as we think about all these things. It's anchored in this truth that God the kingdom and the power and the glory belong to him for all ages. Have you ever, have you ever been driven to prayer out of fear and worry and anxiety? Absolutely. I, I, I think for many people, those become motivating factors. But it's truth that's the only trustworthy anchor for understanding reality. So if fear is motivating us to begin to seek the face of the Lord, it's good to be anchored in truth. God, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. 
you are king and sovereign over all. And all of my concerns and all of my petitions I bring before you as king and sovereign over all. Lord, you are, and you alone are all powerful. You and you alone can forgive sins and change hearts and change circumstances. And that's why I'm coming to you. This is the truth that I'm anchoring that I would understand reality. My fears, my anxieties, my worries, they pale in comparison to the one who is eternally and forever glorious. Do you understand how it's significant that we close with this kind of benediction, that we anchor ourselves in truth so that we understand reality? And that's my invitation to you even this morning, is that you would understand reality as God has put it before us. And that reality is that we are all complete idiots. We all make a mess of our own lives in one way or another. So this isn't like comparing who's the bigger idiot or who's the better idiot. This is just saying, I've made a mess of my life. When I, when I look at what Scripture says and how God has called me to live, it doesn't measure up. So there's not a singular moment, not a nanosecond in time that God looks down from heaven and says, that's my boy, that's my girl. There's somebody that belongs in heaven with me. No, our, our truth for understanding reality is that I'm a sinner before a holy God. But my future and yours can be incredibly bright. As you look away from yourself, you're no longer living to please God or merit or earn his favor. You just look to the finished work of Christ and you say, there, Jesus lived a life I could never live. And he died a death that I deserve. And my future is incredibly bright because he's given me his future and taken mine upon himself. And anyone can get in on this. Anyone who's humble enough to say, I've made a mess of my life. I've sinned before a holy God and my only hope is the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And that Jesus is your savior, your sustainer, and your safeguard. And he's reminding you even in this moment, dear child, he has never left you nor forsaken you. He is with you and he is able to deliver you. So this morning, cry out to the Lord. Cry out to him, perhaps with a repentant heart, saying, Lord, forgive me of my sin." Give me new life. Maybe crying out to him in a fresh and a new, Lord, I know you are able to deliver from evil. And maybe it's just the prayer of faith and the prayer of hope. God, you work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your name. So I pray whatever trial or circumstance you're going through, God, show me where you're at work. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Let's bow our heads and our hearts this morning and ask the Lord to truly be Lord, Savior, Sustainer, Safeguard over our life. Father, thank you for this model prayer. Lord, thank you for reminding us that, that we belong to you as children. Lord, we confess that you're our sustainer. All that we have and all that we need, they come from your hand. And this morning, Lord, we're reminded that you're our safeguard. That you've bought us by the blood of Christ and you keep us. And you desire to deliver us. So God, I pray for my brothers and sisters, even this morning. Some of them may be facing temptation or trials beyond what I could even fathom. So God, I pray that you would, you would deliver them. Lord, I pray that you'd deliver them by anchoring their lives in the truth that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Jesus, help them to fix their eyes upon you, the author and finisher of their faith. 
and God be exalted in our lives and in your church. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, friends, this morning, I just wanted to remind you about prayer and that barrier that may exist, the barrier of self-sufficiency. God regularly gives you more than you can handle, and he's calling you in this moment to trust him, to look to him, to cry out to him. And maybe the, the cry and the response of your heart is, Lord, I need you. I need the salvation that you alone can give. If you have questions about what that means to follow Jesus, if, if you want to visit, pray with me. I, I'll be standing here. But you can also reach out, whether you're watching online, Facebook, or YouTube. Just type a message in the comment section right now. Say, I, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to a pastor. Or if you don't want to be that public, just text the word decision to our church number, 580-606-6700. Just type the word decision and, and we'll reach out to you. We know that you want to talk to a pastor. Let's stand together, let's sing, and let's begin to turn our eyes upon Jesus, our safeguard, the author and finisher of our faith.